Hey, hi everyone, Phil here. Today we're going to go ahead and prove this result. It's a very important result that you see even in basic stats course. So you should know how to apply it even if you don't need to prove it. Okay, this result goes by various names. Law of total probability is most, probably the most popular. It's also called the partition theorem. In doing this, we're going to have to go over a few important concepts. The partition, what is a partition? We're going to talk about tree diagrams and we're going to need to prove this thing, the axioms of probability. Right, so this says, to calculate the probability of event A, suppose I'm given information on the conditional probabilities of A, given some other events BI, and probabilities of BIs. So this is called conditional probability of A given BI, this is called marginal probability of B. So usually, like when you're doing um, applied modeling, we don't may, may not be able to calculate probability A directly, but we know from the structure of the model the conditional probabilities and the marginal probabilities, and then this is useful. And we can depict this thing in a tree diagram. So some of you have already seen this kind of thing in high school, so I'm just going to draw it for this case where we've got four s events for B. We may think about the calculation of the right-hand side in terms of tree diagram like this. So first, you've got one of four things can happen here because we've got four sets for B. And then after that, you're in, in that kind of state of nature. So then you've got, if you go on here, that A occurs given that you've got B1 or A doesn't occur that you've got B1. Uh, in other words, A doesn't occur, so A complement given B1. Now, the usefulness of this thing is when we assign the probabilities to these events. Then when you multiply the branches together like this one with this one, let's just do this top line, that's probability of B1 times probability of A given B1. But by conditional probability, this is equal to probability of A and B1. So the definition of conditional probability, remember, A given B is equal to probability A and B over probability of B, given that probability of B is bigger than zero. So if I multiply this and this, this gives me the probability of A1 and B1, supposing that probability of B1 is bigger than zero. Now we can do the same for each of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, eight, but we're only interested in the ones that involve probability of A given that, not probability of com A complement, so we're not interested in that one. So do it for this one and this one. So now I multiply these probabilities, and the whole point is I can do this because I've got these numbers, right, in this, uh, in my whatever problem I have. And if you add up these intersections, they give you the probability of A. So we set out to calculate the probability of A, we can't do it directly, but I know it probability of like the BIs and probability of the conditional probability of A given the BIs, then I can use this uh, equation. Uh, so for using the tree diagram almost kind of um, got the idea of how we're going to prove this thing. question is why is it that if you add that the probability of the A intersection of the BIs that gives you the probability of A? Well, we're going to be able to see that by drawing it out. So we're drawing a Venn diagram. Okay, so let's just draw out um, sample space, that's the list of everything elements that can outcomes that can occur. Now we need to know what is a partition. So the B1 to B4, there's the these are events, they form a partition of S. Right, this is important. So the definition of partition as follows. So the B1 to B4 form a partition of S if t two things are satisfied. One is that the BIs are mutually disjoint, i.e. the no intersection between them. And secondly, is that the union of those events, the BIs, is equal to S. So that's a technical way to say it. Let's think about it in layman's terms. Let's think of some examples. Right, a jigsaw puzzle, guys. So the jigsaw puzzle, think of that as S, that's, and the pieces form a partition of the jigsaw. Why? Because each jigsaw piece, you know, they do not overlap with another jigsaw piece, right? It's just all distinct. But if you put them together, either union, that forms the jigsaw. Or think about a plate 
drop a plate, smash it into pieces. Those pieces form a partition of your plate. Now, how can it smash? It can smash in any number of ways. So, when you partition it, so long as it's satisfied, uh, those two conditions satisfied, it doesn't matter about um, how it smashes, right? So, for example, if I want to partition this, that could this bit could be B1, this could be B2, B3, B4, but that's not the only partition. We could find other partitions, like this. Let's think of another one that you don't often see. So say that this one rectangle is B1, that is B2, this is B3, B4, then you agree that the BIs here also form a partition. Okay, let's work with this one. Let's suppose the BIs look like this. Then event A is also in the sample space, so it can be anything you like. Draw any other shape. Let's just do something that you don't often see in textbooks or something. Let's do, do this triangle. Let's say this is A. Now, guys, we're going to talk about why is it when you add up these four intersections, it gives you a probability of A. But let's think about this, guys. Let's think about the breaking it down to pieces. Let's think, look at this piece here. What is that? It's A intersection B2. What is this piece here? This is A intersection B1. Okay, I'm still doing well for colors. I've got lots of colors. All right, how about this one here? A and B4. And maybe this one, finally, is A and B3. So we have got them all now. What do you notice is that the events A intersection BIs, they are mutually disjoint or mutually exclusive. Okay, they don't overlap, no intersection between them. And also if you put them together, the union of them, it gives you back, it gives you A. In other words, the union of these three sets is equal to the event A. And if you apply the third axiom, the countably additive axiom, then you get the result of this proof. So we've just actually talked about the idea of the proof. So if I can say it again, these four distinct intersections, they form A. So the probability of A is equal to probability of each of these intersections, which is what in your tree diagram just laying out in a, in a, in a tree. Because right, some of you don't want to dig in your textbooks, I'm just going to give it to you here, but you should check in your lecture notes as well. These are the three axioms. Sometimes your professor might state slightly differently. This is the third one. Okay, very important for proofs. This is the third one, known as a countably additive assumption. Okay, so let's start now doing the proof. Since the event A, we can see from the Venn diagram, is equal to the union of the intersections of the A of the BIs, Therefore, if we talk about probability of A, that's going to be the same as talking about probability of this event, because the two events are the same. Now, the next line follows by axiom 3, because I've got four events here. We can see from the Venn diagram, they are pairwise disjoint and mutually exclusive. And so by this axiom 3, since each of these four things are okay, pairwise disjoint, then the probability of the union there is equal to the sum of the probabilities of each of these events, the four events. The final line, and we're pretty much done, is that, can you see this probability of the intersection is equal to that by the definition of the conditional probability formula, probability A given B equals probability A and B divided by probability of B. So that's for each of them, and that ends the proof. This holds, though, it's important to say in this question that the, th this requires, the third line there requires that the probability of each of these events bi is bigger than zero. Yeah, because probability of a given b is equal to probability of a and b divided by probability of b if probability of b is bigger than zero, is the definition. Otherwise, you'd be dividing by zero and you've got problems there. Okay, guys, um, the proof here, I've done like just writing it out as simply as I can, right? Um, but if you wanted to tidy up this 
first line is a you can rewrite it like this. The second line is the same as writing like this with the sum sign. And this is you can write it again more compactly with the sum sign, which was the actually the question in the question. Okay, now I'm going to uh, make some uh, comments now. Okay, this is where you have to do some thinking. So actually, comments are usually more interesting parts or discussion parts of the video. Let's say in this third line, some of you are really thinking, you'll say, okay, this the here is true, right? But you might say, well, given the conditional probability formula, this statement is also true. You know, the same with the other three. Uh, and I agree with you that conditional probability using conditional probability formula, both of these is equal to this. Alright? But guys, this one is not useful. This one is more useful. Why? Well, recall what it is we're trying to do uh, with this expression. We're trying to calculate probability of A, right? But look at this one in green. You're trying to find this in terms of the knowns. Well, this expression gives probability of A which is unknown. So you're expressing probability of something unknown once express it in terms of things that are unknown. So these two are known. This guy is unknown. So though it's true, it's not helpful. Second thing is about this um, expression. Can I just go over here? Is that when is it useful? So it's useful given probability of these conditional probabilities and probability of B. How about if A are independent of the BIs? Will this be useful? The answer is no. So it's useful if the A's are independent of the BIs. I'm wondering whether I want to explain to you why. Um, okay, I don't want to make the video too long. But if probability A given B I independent, then recall that probability of A given B, if A is independent of B, is probability of A. Yeah, if A is independent of B, uh, and given that probability of B is bigger than zero. Better right here in case some of you are not reading. All right, so here, so probability if A independent of B, then probability A given B is equal to probability of A given probability of B. So substitute this into this expression, and you'll see that you don't get anything meaningful. Third comment is that we've just done this proof, guys, for the case that we have. Um, partition B1 to B4, so we can split up the sample space into four uh, distinct pieces. Uh, but it actually holds more generally, so we can replace this B4 by infinite amounts, so B1, B2, B3. So it holds for um, it holds for a countable collection. So can I just replace this more generally now by saying B1, B2, and then just go dot dot dot, so it goes on and on and on. on and the BIs form a countable collection. I don't want to make it too technical, so if you, let's just countable collection, guys. And then in that case, we'll place this 4 by infinity. The proof, the proof then, will f be exactly the same as what we've done here, because we're, pr we're OK, because by axiom 3, this holds for up to infinite amount, right, of a countable collection of sets the AIs. Since the result holds for infinite, the uh, countable union of uh, countable collection of sets, then it must hold for a finite number of sets. So that's what we've used here. Finite here being we've just got four sets. Guys, finally, I want to end up with another result that uses the idea of partition, which hopefully by now you know is very important. So given uh, B, uh, B1, B2 forms a partition of the sample space such that the probability of each of these events occurring is bigger than zero. Then we've got that the expected value of x, which we'll call the mean of x, may be computed in terms of the conditional expectation of x given the bi's times probability of bi. So look at this result and compare it to the result we've just proved. This is uh, so this says that basically we can compute the mean of x, if we can't compute it directly but we know information about the expected value of x given the bi's which from you in uh, some kind of modeling process you would when you build a model you will be able to get this and that okay and this goes by a number of names it goes by the name of probably the most uh, 
popular one is law, law of total expectations. We compare that to the proof today of the law of total probability. This one is the law of total expectations, otherwise known as Adam's law, otherwise known, especially in econometrics, as the law of iterated expectations. Okay, whether you want to see the proof of this, which follows in a similar way to what we've done today, uh, just um, you might want to try it or let me know. Okay, um, so I hope that's been helpful. Um, so share, like, comment. See you guys.